Hello, it's Randy Rhodes. Here's a clip from our show, and go to randyrhodes.com for the whole thing and a podcast. Buy a stinking podcast. Mary had a little man, man, man. The fault. We believe that all men are created equal. The magnificent mosaic that is America. From Radio Beacon to Radio Beacon. Change has come to America. Believe me. Knock, knock. Who's there? It's a segment of your imagination. Randy Rhodes Show. Turn up your mind. The New York Times reporting overnight that lawyers for convicted Trump campaign chair Paul Manafort were briefing President Trump's legal team on what Manafort was telling the special counsel, Robert Mueller. This information sharing came before Manafort's plea deal with Mueller collapsed. Want to break down what it means with our chief legal analyst, Dan Abrams. And this idea that he was telling Trump what he was telling Mueller is not illegal, but it is pretty unusual. He's basically playing both sides. Right. So joint defense agreements are pretty normal, particularly in kind of mob cases and gang related cases where the defense teams share information. What makes this different is effectively Manafort was saying with his plea, I'm on your side now. Right. I'm with you, prosecutors. And I'm going to assist you in whatever way you need. In effect, he wasn't doing that. It's starting to feel like he was on a fact-finding mission for the Trump team to figure out exactly what do they want, what kinds of questions are they asking, etc. How could Trump's team use that? Well, they could use it, A, publicly. It seems that some of President Trump's tweets were a direct response to information that he got from Manafort's team. It can allow him to prepare for a defense. It can allow him to prepare his report uh, that he's going to use as a response, etc. But I think most importantly, it becomes a kind of a cudgel for them to use against Robert Mueller by saying, you know, that he's trying to get witnesses to say certain things, etc. It also reinforces what you were saying yesterday, that Manafort might be playing for a pardon from President Trump. I don't think there's any question he's playing for a pardon. I mean, I think that by saying I'm with you prosecutors and then not not just not cooperating, but according to prosecutors lying repeatedly and they can prove that. Right. They're saying they can prove it. You have to believe that he thinks he's got another option here. But if at any point the president or his lawyers told Manafort, don't worry, you can get a pardon? Well, look, the question becomes, is the power of the pardon absolute? That sure sounds like witness tampering in any other context, where you're basically saying to a witness, don't help or lie, or tell me what they're saying. That sure feels like witness tampering. Some people argue, though, that the power of the pardon is absolute. That's the sort of question that would be resolved down the road. Holy crap. You know, this joint defense agreement it always struck me as being over if, uh, you know, Manafort had flipped and had left the group of people who were, uh, you know, adversarial to the government and joined the government as being an adversary against those very people. But they're telling us, oh, no, oh, no, Manafort thought he was really smart. He thought that he would say he was cooperating with Mueller, lie to Mueller, and go back and tell Giuliani and Seculo and the Raskins everything that he was lying to Mueller about and that they could all then, I told you yesterday, there were two groups of people, right? There was the Corsis, there was the uh, Stones, and there were the Manaforts and the Trumps, right? And that they were all going to get their lies, uh, you know, straight, tell the same lie and defeat Mueller. But it's starting to look to me like Mueller had no doubt that Manafort was this huge scumbag and would never tell him the truth. And it looks like Mueller always knew that Manafort was lying to him. And it also looks like they never needed Manafort's testimony because he's got emails, And we know he's got emails because Jerome Corsi produced the indictment to CNN yesterday after we got done. Uh, Jerome Corsi, see, Mueller never leaks. So what we have is Jerome Corsi's indictment. And, uh, you know, what it it says is that uh, they knew that Jerome Corsi lied about being in contact with WikiLeaks because they have emails not only from Jerome Corsi, to uh, uh, people that, uh, you know, were tipping him off about the, de- the dates of the document dumps, but also to Roger Stone. And Roger Stone was writing back to Jerome Corsi, especially in a frenzy, when the Access Hollywood tape dropped. Roger Stone was writing to Corsi and saying to Corsi, uh, release it now. 
Release it now. The Access Hollywood tape, they, they, this is going to, you know, kill them. This is going to release more documents, right? And the really interesting thing about 2016 is that Roger Stone was calling Trump directly. He was a candidate then, so nobody really knew exactly how often they were speaking or what they were talking about. But Roger Stone did say a day after he received this email from Jerome Corsi saying, you know, dirt's coming. At the time, Stone did this radio program and said, oh, yeah, I just spoke to the president yesterday, a day after he received this email. Now, Roger Stone insists he never discussed WikiLeaks with President Trump, but he's saying that to me. He's not saying it under oath. And, and just to add to that, something we know that we've discussed before on the show, Trump mentions WikiLeaks over 130 times mm. publicly in the final month of the campaign. This is someone who has not only cheerleading, but more than a passing familiarity with the organization and what they may be doing to help his effort. Yeah, I mean, it, look, no dots have been officially connected by Robert Mueller that we, obviously, that he shared with us. But the, I, when you hear President Trump talk about WikiLeaks so often, let's just listen to this, because it's starting to not sound like a coincidence. Listen to this. No. This WikiLeaks stuff is unbelievable. It tells you the inner heart. You got to read it. Another one came in today. This WikiLeaks is like a treasure trove. I was just getting off the plane. They were just announcing new WikiLeaks, and I wanted to stay there, but I didn't want to keep you waiting. This just came out. WikiLeaks. I love WikiLeaks. Okay. Pres <laughs> presidential candidate or PR agent for WikiLeaks? I don't know, but here's what I think is really interesting, Sarah, and maybe you can help everybody connect the dots here, because everybody remembers the Access Hollywood tape, okay? That's something that obviously caught the nation's attention. There is a nexus between the Access Hollywood tape now, in terms of dates, and WikiLeaks. So on the day that the Access Hollywood tape is coming out, Jerome Corsi and Roger Stone have three conversations, according to Jerome Corsi, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. About, you better get the WikiLeaks thing out soon? And, and, was it like and WikiLeaks documents, I mean, they were dropped something like 30 minutes after yes. the Access Hollywood tape came out. So this has always been a big question in this investigation, is did WikiLeaks get some kind of guidance from someone saying, now is the time, now is the time to pull the trigger and release this stuff, we're trying to mitigate the fallout. Now, Stone insists that he never asked Jerome Corsi to do any of this, that he didn't ever believe Corsi was in touch with WikiLeaks anyway. But Corsi says, you know, he called me over and over again and, and told me to, you know, try to get to Assange and say if there's something to get out, put it out now. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh. So it wasn't a coincidence after all that the Access Hollywood tape is, uh, you know, uh, all over our TVs. And 30 minutes later, there's a WikiLeaks document dump. Isn't that something? And Mueller has the emails. And Jerome Corsi says he deleted them, but he deleted them by mistake. He wasn't trying to cover up anything. He just didn't remember that he was doing this. That's his story. That is his story. Sarah, you just spoke with Jerome Corsi. He's accused of being Stone's middleman to WikiLeaks. He's the one with these new documents. What is he saying about this case that Mueller is trying to build against him? That's right. He provided these documents to us, Jake. He's in some legal hot water. And, you know, they outline the alleged lies Corsi told, but also Roger Stone's, you know, sort of willingness, efforts to try to get these documents from WikiLeaks, at least uh, from Robert Mueller's point of view. And one of these documents, it's actually an email on August 2nd. It's an email from Jerome Corsi to Roger Stone. Whoops. And Corsi said, word is, friend in embassy plans two more dumps, one shortly after I'm back, second in October. Impact planned to be very damaging, so you can see why Mueller's team believed that Corsi had intel, was sharing that with Stone. Corsi says he was never in touch with Assange. Now, there is a comment from Roger Stone. He insists he never got a heads up on any actual information and says, like every politico and every political reporter in America, I was curious about curious. what WikiLeaks had. So, mm -hmm. insisting he did nothing wrong, Jake. And there's always been this question about why the WikiLeaks dump was on the same day, just minutes after the release mm -hmm. of that Access Hollywood tape. But what did Corsi have to say? You asked him about it. And one of the questions was whether it was somehow orchestrated. So Corsi said that he's actually provided information to the grand jury, and he said Roger Stone was in touch with him that day. Here's what he had to say about it. We get to October 7, which was a very, very busy day for me here in New York. And um, uh, Roger calls me three times. We have three times we have a discussion. Now, my recollection is that Roger is saying, you know, this Billy Bud is going to be dropped, mm -hmm. and if and Assange better get going.
Oh, my God. Uh, why don't you get to your buddy Assange and tell him to start? Well, I didn't have any contact with Assange. You know, but Roger, going back to July and August, mm -hmm. uh, may have you know may have led him on. Now, Roger Stone insists that this is false. He said he didn't talk about uh, this with Jerome Corsi. He said he had no heads up in the hours before this Access Hollywood Billy Bush tape was released. So it's a he said, he said situation right now, Jake. Yeah, except it's not. There's emails. <laughs> and that's the problem. It's always the freaking emails. And, uh, you know, but what about her emails? Yeah, well, it's uh, not going to be very important anymore. So here's what happened. Jerome Corsi emails Roger Stone about WikiLeaks plans to, uh, you know, release dirt on Hillary Clinton 10 weeks before anything is published. 10 weeks before. And tells... Stone that WikiLeaks has the stolen DNC documents. It seems to me that Mueller also has a, and this is this is why it was so weird that you know we in an unrelated case in Virginia. Remember, uh, they were filing a case against some child, uh, you know, child predator, a pedophile, a pedophile, in Virginia, and somebody in the prosecutor's office copied and pasted uh, a uh, indictment for Julian Assange, and so we got this little. A heads up that uh, Mueller had the goods on Assange and that there's there's a sealed indictment for Julian Assange and s some of the information that uh, tells us that uh, uh, what he has on Julian Assange is that he's got an email from Julian Assange that goes to the Russian intelligence agents the GRU right and then 12 of the GRU uh, you know, uh, uh, intel Russian intelligence officers, they're indicted by Mueller. And in that indictment, it's also a speaking indictment. It was very detailed and it told the whole flow of information and who the trolls were and where they were and who they worked for. And it turned out to be Putin's chef was financing them and this troll farm in St. Petersburg and all that. Well, it turns out that Julian Assange was in touch with these GRU intelligence officers because in there it says, you know, person one and person two. And then and we start to, you know, now see who these persons are. So there's an email from uh, Assange to the GRU uh, asking for the hacked DNC material. Around that same time, you've got Corsi being clued in that the that Julian Assange has documents from the GRU, and he's telling Roger Stone the dates for the dumps. The dates the documents will come out. Now the only hitch in their whole plan was the Access Hollywood tape. Oh my God, better do it now. Better. And there's a frenzy that day, okay? There's an absolute frenzy. Jerome Corsi says, it was a very busy day for me. October 7th, busy day, busy, busy, busy. Uh, the Billy Bush tape dropped, the Billy Bush tape dropped. And you know, Steve Bannon is on the record telling Donald Trump, it means nothing to us. It doesn't matter. And 30 minutes later, there's a document dumped by WikiLeaks, but there's all this back and forth between Corsi and Stone saying, tell him to do it now. Tell him to do it now. I mean, this is just so bizarre. This is the part of the filing that so bothered the Trump legal team. And Sarah mentioned at the end of her piece, Corsi said that in the summer of 2016, an associate person number one, that's Roger Stone, Hello. who Corsi understood to be in regular contact with senior members of the Trump campaign, including with then-candidate Donald J. Trump, asked Corsi to get in touch with Organization One. Wicked. So what you have there is Mueller's team making a direct connection between people trying to get these emails and the president and Donald Trump. It's right there in the Mueller document. And then, and this was in the Washington Post piece mm. overnight, just slipped in, and I caught it, and it really jumped out to me. Rudy Giuliani, an attorney for Trump, said the president does not recall ever speaking to either Stone or Corsi about WikiLeaks. John Avalon, anyone who has been a day in journalism yeah. knows that's a non-denial denial. Yeah. He does not recall. That is a classic word used to set up a, a condition because you don't know the truth or you don't want to deal with the truth. That is a non-denial denial in journalism. Anyone who's watched a court show knows that that's not uh, a solid foundation on which to build a denial. And the content is pretty stunning. Rudy Giuliani, uh, also apparently, you know, in contact with Manafort's folks. The dots are being connected here in a deeper way than ever before than we've mm -hmm. seen. In Sarah's reporting with Corsi, among the things we see is also an indication that he communicates that there's going to they have damaging information 
related to Hillary and emails that's going to be released in two tranches. One early, the other in October for maximum damage, which is more or less exactly what happened. <laughs> it's just a coincidence, though, everybody. It's just a coincidence. Listen, there are two key articles. Uh, well, there are a whole bunch of really good ones today, but the two key articles that have been referred to by uh, the people uh, in these uh, clips uh, from CNN and uh, MSNBC, uh, they dropped overnight, these two articles. One is a Washington Post article. It's in the homework uh, called Corsi Provided Early Alert to Stone about WikiLeaks release according to draft special counsel document, which Jerome Corsi provided to CNN. And the other one is a New York Times article that shows you that Manafort was acting as a a mole that he was pretending to be cooperating with Mueller, but really reporting back to uh, Trump and Stone and Corsi uh, the lie that Manafort was going to tell so that they could all tell it too. And they got caught. Go to randyroads.com for the whole thing and a podcast. Buy a stinking podcast.